Another episode here of Getting There with Gaz, where we're talking about the career journeys of media members, coaches, athletes, business owners, and more. A big UFC card this weekend, the best of the summer. And I had to bring on my pal, MMA reporter, writer. He does it all for this sport. Mike Heck joins us. So Mike, six, seven, eight years old, a younger version of you. What'd you want to be as a kid? And was it the same dream job you wanted when you were 18? Um, that's a great question. I always wanted to be a game show host, Gaz. That was that was <laughs> my uh, my life goal as a child. And I think that goal has kind of stuck with me, at least in some way throughout my life. So if I was given an option, like a door to walk through when I was 18, it would have been, it definitely would have been a game show host. I definitely wanted to work in sports. Uh, part of me wanted to be a high school baseball coach. So when you're 18, there's just so many things in front of you and you really don't know 100% what you want to do. But I would say even today, you know, seeing like Aaron Rodgers and some of these guys host Jeopardy, there's a part of me that's a little jealous, my friend. There's a part of me that's a little bit jealous of that whole situation. So uh, yeah, I would say game show host is definitely 1A in my book. All right, so it's Trebek. It's not Bob Barker. It's not Drew Carey. It's it's a, I guess Drew Carey was came l- later on when you're all right. So Trebek was the guy that basically, if you had to rank your favorite game show host of all time, Whew. yeah, he's up there. Peter Tamarkin from Step uh, Pressure Luck was my guy. I was a big okay. fan of his. Barker obviously with 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 Price is Right and just so many even even like John Davidson who. Like when, when I used to watch old school WCW, I thought Eric Bischoff looked just like John Davidson <laughs> from uh, Hollywood Square. So yeah, there I watched all the game shows. I was a big game show nut when I was a little kid. All right. So when you're 18, I don't know if you go to game show school. Unfortunately, it doesn't <laughs> exist. Do you decide to go the college route? And if you do, where do you go? And if you don't, what do you start to do post high school? So I wasn't the greatest student. I I, I could have been. I just would rather just hang out with people and play sports. So <laughs> I actually got a little bit of a scholarship to go play baseball at Fitchburg State University in Massachusetts. And kind of like I was in high school, I decided that sports trumped everything else. So I lasted two years and then uh, the grades were not there. And that was it. My baseball career ended right there and then. Uh, my education career ended right there and then. And... Yeah, that was it. I I gave it a whirl and it just wasn't for me. All right. So now you're 20. You're out of school. You're not playing baseball. I'm sure your parents, your family is like, all right, you got to do something with your life. Now, what happens? Are you looking for a job? What what goes on with Mike Heck now in your early 20s? Basically 20 years old. I'm all over the place, man. I'm still trying to like find a way to play baseball. I'm thinking about maybe going to community college to keep this thing going. I lasted like six months in community college. Like I said, school just wasn't for me. I did a lot of odd jobs. Uh, I was a locksmith. I was a bartender. I was a waiter. I was, um, what else was I? I sold gym memberships for a while. Uh, (laughs) I I did a little bit of everything uh, through my 20s. And uh, yeah, I was just all over the place. Still wanted to be a game show host. Still wanted to work in sports somehow. And it didn't really work. Like I started DJing a little bit too. DJing weddings and like karaoke shows and trivia nights and things like that. So I got a little bit of the, I got to scratch a little bit of the game show itch, if you will. But yeah, I was still kind of lost in my twenties. I didn't realize what what I was going to do until, until the next decade. Yeah. And it's interesting because you said some of those keywords that are like trivia host and DJing weddings. So you're getting that exposure to the entertainment industry. You mentioned the next decade because we're talking about timeline now, like the mid 2000s basis is what we're talking about, I believe, at this point. So isn't your first job in entertainment a radio gig that's not a sports job, though? So I I started DJing when I was like 16. My brother, my older brother was making a lot of money DJing weddings and doing these shows. And like the hourly pay DJing was way better than hourly pay doing anything else. So I started learning the craft back then. Uh, I didn't. The radio thing was a complete like weird scenario. It kind of came out of nowhere. Um, So I live out in the Berkshires now, which you probably know because of our town square sort of affiliation between us. And I moved out to help my brother, who was also on the same radio station that I worked for back in the day, launch his DJ company. So he had just moved to the Berkshires. He did radio for a while and then said, you know what? Like, I I feel like there's a hole to be filled. So I'm going to start my own entertainment company do, doing the weddings and DJs and karaoke and stuff like that. So I being the lost 29, 30 year old guy 
talk to my brother and he's like, you should come out here and, and help me launch this thing. So he's, just, he's like, I got some big plans. I'm, I'm thinking about doing game show nights. And that's all I needed to hear. I was <laughs> in the car two and a half hours and uh, I stayed with him for a little while. And yeah, that's how it started. Karaoke, trivia, weddings, things like that. And I did that for a couple of years. I bartended as well in the Berkshires and I really enjoyed what I was doing. I met my now wife around the same time, being the guy like not looking for a relationship, being in a new place. Three months later, I meet my wife and then we get married like a year, a year and a half later, which is nuts. But the radio thing happened. Like I was making kind of a name for myself doing the, the karaoke and, and the DJ stuff. And I'm in Connecticut and I get a call from my older brother. I'm at a family function. And uh, he's like, you got a second to talk? I said, sure. And he goes, what are your thoughts about being on the radio on Live 95.9? And I was like, really? I was like, why Why are they looking at me? He's like, well, they had a, they, they, they tried to fill a morning role. Uh, Brian Slater, who still does mornings over there, jumped over from afternoons to mornings. So they need an afternoon guy. They had somebody in mind. They didn't think he, he would say no. And he said no. He goes, so I brought your name up because he had just got into the marketing and, and sales side of things. And I was like, sure. And then I'm driving home from Connecticut and Slater calls me and he was like, I just want to let you know, like, this isn't a sports radio station. Like, this is hit music. We talk about like Miley Cyrus and not about David Ortiz or Manny Ramirez. <laughs> and I was like, that's fine, man. Like, I'm I'm into it. Let's go. And so I, I did some weekend shifts with him, just kind of voice tracked some Saturday and Sunday shifts for a while. Did that for like three weeks. It was kind of waiting to see if I was going to get this job. And then <laughs> this other this other gentleman who I worked with for a while, his mom posts on Facebook that, I'm so excited. Billy got the job as the full-time radio host at Live 95.9. So I was gutted. I was heartbroken. And I called Slater on the phone and I was like, dude, I didn't get it. Like, what else did I need to do? And he was like, no, nah, man. He goes, that's, that's not true. He goes, leave it alone. <laughs> it's, not, it's not right. So I'm at a bartending shift, like just freaking out because I didn't get this job that I worked my butt off for. And then I find out like three days later, I actually did get the job. So that's how my radio journey began. <laughs> wow. So I, I got to follow up as much as you want to talk about that story. So this guy's mom, I, he obviously must have told her something or he must have got some bad info. Because I can't even imagine seeing that you lose a job to somebody it's all over social media. <laughs> it's not true. Like somebody got catfished early on in this thing or something, some variation of that. Do you want to share more of that or you can stay away if you want of how the hell that you got fooled by that basically? Or maybe they didn't like it. Maybe they flat out said, don't say anything and they didn't listen to the rule. I think he thought he was like up for it and his mom was like, oh, he got the job. Like he was a weekend okay. guy for a while, but I remember that I remember that day very clearly because I was bartending and I had like friends of mine just come in and they had this sour puss on their faces and they're like, man, I'm really sorry you didn't get the job. I was like, what are you talking about? And then I asked my manager, I'm like, can I just grab my phone for a second? And they're like, oh, it's on Facebook. You got to see it. And, and then immediately I was like, I'm taking my break and I go out and, and I call Slater. I'm like, I was like, what happened? I thought I was like, I was in a good spot. He goes, goes, she's crazy. Don't worry about it. Uh, it's, it's, we haven't made a decision yet. So the job is still on the table. It, we haven't filled it yet. Like just act as if like nothing has happened. And I was like, whew, sigh of relief. And I went on to bartend. And then like 72 hours later, I, I find out that I got it. So you are talking about Miley Cyrus and pop music in comparison to the sports fan that you are. Uh, voice track, by the way, for those who don't know that term, that's basically as much as we'd love to believe the DJs are in the studio playing the tracks. No, usually it's recorded ahead of time and they go off and do their own thing for certain things. For those who didn't know that term, especially on the music side. So when you're doing this, are you enjoying it? Do you still have the itch that you want to do sports? Take us through kind of these early few months of you going to a career you never thought you'd have in radio. So... What happened was like right before the radio thing even came to be, I started a sports podcast with one of my buddies who used to live in the Berkshires, but had moved out to Chicago because I had listened to Stone Cold Steve Austin's podcast. And I was like, I can do something like this. I was like, well, I'll just, you know, all you got to do is hit record and talk about sports. So that's what I did. We talked about, I talked about the Red Sox and Boston sports. He talked about Chicago sports because he's a big Chicago fan. Um, and we had like, we, we had like no listeners, absolutely none. We had a, uh, <laughs> There was one episode that actually did really well. It was like our fourth or fifth episode. And we were talking about, we had a conversation. We had a gentleman from, uh, from Sy who writes, it does a lot of stuff for Syracuse basketball. Come on. And we were talking, had a discussion about whether or not college athletes should be paid. 
And for some reason, that one like took off. We got like a couple thousand downloads, and I was like, "All right, we're off to the races. Here we go. We're gonna be on WEI in Boston in three months." <laughs> and then again, like nobody listened after that. So it was. A, so I started doing that. Like at least I that that kind of like I, I don't know if that helped me get the job because like the operations manager at the time had listened to the podcast. It was like, all right, one thing you got to do is you got to get rid of the Boston accent because it was like it was pretty strong back then. He goes, you gotta, try, you gotta try to get rid of it. I was like, I was like, I can work on it, but there are times where I'm gonna get a little fired up, and I, it's gonna come out. Like, there's just no way around it. Like, I will lose 95 percent of it, but I can't lose 100 percent of it. And I'm like, if you're okay with that, I will bring the noise. I was like, but that noise might have a Boston accent every so often. He was like, all right, we could, we could deal with that. So, um, yeah. so that's how that started, and then just the radio, and then. You know, now I'm talking about Ed Sheeran's new song and Taylor Swift's 45 Boyfriends, and it was just off to the races from there. Yeah, those accents, by the way, they're from Boston, New York, wherever you might be. It's usually getting excited or having a few drinks in you or you're around your buddies. You know, it's one of those three that the accent gets a little bit stronger. I always joke around the Syracuse accent. It's very whiny, and all of a sudden my voice gets really high-pitched and whiny when I said back to Central New York and everything like that. Uh, MMA. So, like, we've talked about all the different paths you've gone, and I don't want to steer away from Ed Sheeran, although he's very talented. He's got some great tunes. My wife loves him. But we haven't mentioned MMA because early on, like, when we're talking late 90s, early 2000s, now we're into, like, the 2010 decade. Look, the UFC is established. MMA is established. When did you start becoming a fan of the sport for the first time? I watched it off and on because it was just, like, the thing to do. Like people would show me fights. It was like this dude's fighting in a cage. Like uh, if if the opportunity presented itself, I would watch. I'd go to video stores and rent the videos for like ninety nine cents, and they were in that weird section that nobody ever wants to go to. But right next to the porn section, you could say it. that's what you right. say. Like right, I'll like let you was, say it. Yeah, it was like the WWE <laughs> throwback. It was like yeah. WrestleMania, Royal Rumble. Then it was the UFC when it was like super barbaric, and then the porn section with the little curtain. That's where it was, like right next to that stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's where it was. So, so I'd watch like old fights, and there would be times where I'd go out and like shoot pool and stuff. And you know, I, I watched Chuck Liddell become the UFC light heavyweight champion when he knocked out Randy Couture. But the thing that really got me into it was the first season of The Ultimate Fighter because I was a big Diego Sanchez mark. I thought he was so weird that he was just amazingly fascinating. So I would watch The Ultimate Fighter every week, and it turned out that I wasn't alone because a lot of my friends that I went to high school with were also into it and were also into it for the same reasons I was. They wanted to see Diego Sanchez just be weird and and, and crazy. So I watched that. We watched, I had a bunch of people over at my parents' house and we watched the finale and watched Diego become the ultimate fighter. We were all excited. And then Forrest Griffin and Stefan Bonner had their fight and it was absolutely ridiculous. It, I mean, it pretty much put the UFC on the map because everybody was calling their friends saying, oh my God, you have to watch this fight. It's absolutely insane. Like it makes no sense. There's no technique. They're just swinging bolos at each other, hoping one guy falls and no one's fallen. It's just the most crazy fight ever. And we watched that. We watched Ken Shamrock, obviously, because he was a a big WWE guy and watched him get knocked out by Rich Franklin. So that's kind of how it started for me being a fan of the sport. Like, and I would have waves of it early on. Like I'd watch it all the time. And then I would not watch it. And then I was like, eh, do I want to like sit home and watch the UFC or do I want to go out and, you know, meet girls and hang out with my buddies? And I chose the latter 99% of the time. But whenever I could watch the UFC, I did. Uh, but it was probably like, you know, six or seven years later, probably like right around when I started the podcast where I really started to get back into it again. Yeah. And even like the UFC at this point at MMA in general, there was almost like this legitimacy, not of the sport, because the athletes are legit, no doubt, and what the action was happening inside the octagon was legit, but it was so fresh and so new. This path of being a writer and reporter like you are, there wasn't really like a trailblazer yet. Like Ariel Hawani is the biggest name, and he has been since his days back in college and everything else, but I think that's maybe something that attracted you to the sport as well, where it's like, Okay, if I'm going to do the sports thing, yeah, I like the Boston Red Sox and I'm doing this thing on the top 40 stage and everything else. But, you know, there could be a path of there's not a lot of people who are going to do this as a profession. Did you ever see that as an opportunity of I know you mentioned like just enjoying the fights with your friends and everything else. But six, seven years later, like this could be the thing I could really focus on. It's funny how that all happened because while we were doing the podcast, like I just was like, I I just want to like interview a UFC fighter who was from Boston. 
I don't know why. So I reached out to like Kenny Florian and I reached out to some other guys. And then Joe Proctor, who was in the UFC, he was on one of the seasons of the ultimate fighter. I hit him up. I DM'd him on Twitter and he was like, he was like, yeah, you know, I'll come on and do an interview with you. So I did this like 35 minute interview with him and it was amazing. I was just like, wow, this guy, like his story is pretty cool. And there was a gentleman who actually heard the interview because I had posted on Twitter and for some reason he listened to it and he hits, he DMs me and he's like, he goes, so I, I, I run this little group called Legends of the Cage and I basically manage a lot of the fighters who fought in the early UFCs. Uh, you know, guys like Emmanuel Yarbrough, guys like Dan Severn, guys like that, like who are part of the original, you know, iteration of of the Ultimate uh, Ultimate Fighting Championship. Uh, Art Davey was a part of the group, the founder of the UFC. And he was like, do you want to start interviewing some of the legends of the sport? I was like, yeah, let's do that. So I started interviewing these guys and I found out that probably two months later, they were having this big fan fest out in Syracuse. So I got grabbed a couple of my buddies, uh, even my my podcast co-host from Chicago took a train down and we met in Syracuse and we went to this event and I got to talk to Dan Severn. I got to talk to, and, and there were like current fighters there too, like Felice Herrig, Carla Sparza, uh, Claudia Gedalia, uh, even like guys like Brian Ebersole, Burt Watson was there, who's the come on, baby, used to fire <laughs> up all the fighters in the back for the UFC and does, now does some stuff for Bellator. So I ended up going to that and their MC no showed. So I ended up MCing the entire event and being like, hey, come on over and meet Burt Watson and Dan Severn's over there and you can get a replica of his NWA world championship belt and he'll sign it for you for 25 bucks. Head on over and see him. But from there, like, because I did that, they gave me the opportunity to like interview some of the fighters. So once I got through that weekend and had those conversations and it, it was the same weekend that the UFC had an event. It was when Daniel Cormier beat Alexander Gustafson to retain his light heavyweight title, which was such a crazy fight. So everybody was talking about it. Everyone was talking about the aftermath of that event on, on the second day of the fan fest. And when I left me and my buddy from Chicago went out to lunch and I sat him down and I said, the old podcast that we used to do, it's gone. He goes, what do you mean? I said, we're just going to do MMA from now on. Like, I want to hear these guys' stories. I want to hear these gals' stories. I want to know why they fight because it's so crazy. Like, I'm going to get into a cage and get punched in the face for a living. I found that so uniquely fascinating. So it took him a little while to turn around to that idea, but eventually he was with it. We went all in, and then the show started to, like, get a little traction. We were starting to get picked up by other sites, some of the interviews we were doing. And that's how it all started. Hadn't written a word for MMA at that point. It was just all about getting in and doing the interviews. And I don't know if my old boss from Town Square is hearing this, Mr. Peter Berry, but uh, I want to thank him for giving me the radio station job because I would host my afternoon show. I would go host trivia nights and then I would come back and sneak into the radio station and record the podcast. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> There's two things to add to that point right there. One uh, I've, I've never done that, but I know of other markets and other people who have used their key card to do their own thing because they're an employee. And if you're not bothering anybody, the equipment's right there. So I've never done that, but you are not in the minority. Let's just say of people who have pulled that off. I thought you were even go a second step with that because what a lot of people like to do is once you have an email that has the word media at the end, it's a lot easier to book guests because they'll see like town square media or cumulus media. Now that you're an employee of that Town Square Media, if you wanted to go on and, you know, book a UFC fighter, they see your email and all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, I'll hop on this podcast, not realizing it's a completely separate thing of your other job. I've seen a lot of salespeople sitting in media seats. Let's just say some events I've covered. They're like, oh, no, yeah. I work in sales. I don't actually work in media. So yeah, exactly. like when I when I started there, Town Square did not own us. We were we were like owned by a, a different group. They had sold us. Uh, there were different buyers that almost bought us, but then didn't. And then Town Square came in like at the eleventh hour and and bought us all up. So I probably was like a Town Square employee technically for like fourteen months, but I was part of the radio station for six years. You did mention like the interview sign at the UFC. Actually, I was going to save this for later. I'll now just pop up the nice graphic on the bottom left on the visual side. The best. It advice for interview and in particular ufc mma athletes because you may not feel this way because you've done it for years now it can be really challenging to get that info out of their life stories because there's some vulnerability sharing that 
And also, it seems as if they have more colorful language than maybe any other athletes that you might interview. I would agree with you. Uh, I would say that just just advice for overall interviewing is know what you're talking about. Like at least like I'm not saying like don't don't have a script in front of you. Don't sit there and read questions because oftentimes, and I've made this mistake before. Oftentimes you miss something with their answer and you're just thinking about the next question and you miss some goal that you could have followed up on. And that was one lesson that I, that I learned early on. And I took the approach of, you know, instead of like going after Connor and the world and Ronda Rousey and the world champions, like you're not going to get them. You might get the occasional splash of a UFC fighter here and there, just interview everybody, like get to know like the PR reps from some of the regional scenes that some of which are like feeder leagues to the UFC, get to know these like really talented prospects. So by the time you get to, they get to the UFC or get to Bellator, get to these major organizations, like you already have a relationship with them. Like yes. they're going to remember like when Ariel and Luke Thomas and some of these bigger names are reaching out to them, Hey, come on my show. They're going to remember like, I'm not going on their show. I'm going to go with the guy who like interviewed me when I was fighting for Titan FC or LFA or CES or some of these other regional promotions. So I made it a point to like get to know every single public relations person for all these regional promotions. And just whenever they asked me to interview somebody, I just said, yes, it was just rep, 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 rep. And so got, kind of going back to the non-scripted thing, at least like you have to like do some research. You have to know what you're talking about. Like I love going through like Instagram posts and seeing things of them not being fighters. Like they have a dog or, you know, they went and climbed a mountain or they skied or they snowboarded for the first time. Like just things that will get, get them going because there are some pretty tough cookies out there to interview guys like Uriah Hall, uh, guys like Tanner Bozer who just won on Saturday. Like if you don't, if you don't know your stuff, Tanner will like just flip it around on you and make you feel like an idiot. So those are some of the things that I would do. Like, don't script, just get the reps in and know what you're talking about. Don't go into anything completely cold because it's it's going to come off that way. I mean, you've probably seen some clips of some of these like local news shows bringing on fighters and asking Amanda Nunes if she'd fight a man and stupid questions like that. Like, don't, don't do that. Don't do no, that. don't do that. You mentioned Uriah Hall. We've both interviewed Uriah Hall. Sometimes I feel like he's going to jump through the phone and like just attack you. <laughs> You know, like, like we asked him, like, what's your game plan going into the fight? He's like, I'll just swear, right? Don't get punched in the fucking face was his answer. I'm like, all right, that's answer one. We're going to answer one on that. Okay, Uriah, I'm not going to tell you you can't say that. But okay. Uh, now, now we have this unbelievable thing that's happening in your career. You're doing all the right things. You're building the relationship with the PR people. Your podcast is getting more and more views than ever before because you've got this new method. It's working. But now, like anybody else who has – a passion and a career building, you're still introing Bruno Mars and everybody on the radio side of it. Is there ever a point where there's a clash and you're thinking, okay, I got to make a decision. Is this going to be my job or is this going to be my job? How long can I do two things at once? When, if at all, did that kind of collide and where'd you go with that for your next steps of your career? So there are a lot of instances of that happening. One of which was, you know, my wife was cool with me like, working late and doing interviews because she's not one that like stays up late. She likes to go to bed early and get her, get her eight hours. Uh, and then we welcomed a, a little baby into the world not long after I got the radio station gig, but they both went to bed early. So if I like hosted trivia till nine, nine 30 and they'd be asleep anyway. So it's not like I'm coming home to like this ruckus welcome at the, at the household. It's just like, so if I asked my wife, like, can I just go to the station and like, do this podcast and put it together. Like I'll be home later. She'd be like, yeah, I'm sleeping anyways. So what? So I would do that. And, you know, I was kind of, I was kind of getting burnt out a little bit from it because I'm doing essentially two full-time jobs and I'm trying to keep this podcast going and trying to be consistent. And a lot of times, like I would reach out to managers and fighters to try to book a show for a certain day of the week and I wouldn't hear back and I would do a show. And then like the next day, a manager would reach back out to me and goes, Oh, they're available tonight or they're available like this afternoon or something like that. So then I'd have to like pivot and like record the interview for, and then I drop like another show. So a lot of times, like I, I would get a little burnt out by it, uh, but I kept going. I just wanted to do something. And then things kind of like took a turn as well. Cause I went to cover UFC 208 in Brooklyn. It was like the first pay-per-view event that I covered. And I went out there, I, I used the radio station credential but I was just going essentially for myself. Like, I'm just going to go and like, I knew you would. I knew it. <laughs> yeah. So it was a town square at the time, by the way. So if anyone's listening, uh, so, 
so I went out there and I covered the event and it was, I remember I had to leave a day early because we're, we're getting a wicked snowstorm. And if I waited till like the day I was going to leave, there's no way I was going to get there. So I left like 2 AM in the morning, the hotel I was staying at, like luckily I had an extra room. So I stayed over there and it was such a wild thing to go cover a pay-per-view like that. Cause there's all these different events and there's all this different stuff. And I started meeting like different members of the media. And I ran into this gentleman by the name of Mike Dice, who was, you know, a big wig over at Fansided. So he had come up to me and he goes, oh, Mike, he goes, you ever think about writing? Like, do you ever think about writing anything for MMA? I was like, I was like, not really. Like I do the interviews. He goes, I'm telling you, man, like if you want to make it in the sport, like you have to sprinkle in a little bit of everything. Like you got to learn how to write. Like you could just take your interviews and like turn them into articles. Like I'll show you, I'll teach you everything that I know. And I was like, eh, I'm not really sure. And then I did a couple like exclusive interviews when I was out there. One fight got canceled uh, because there was a botched weight cut. He was hospitalized. So I interviewed his opponent like the day of the fight and got it up quick and it got a lot of traction. So he he would keep hounding me. Like when I got home from the trip, he would keep reaching out to me. He goes, did you decide yet? Did you decide yet? So finally, like I took the leap and decided to go and and, and start learning how to write. So I did a lot of stuff for Fansided. And we were starting to take off. Like we had a really good team. Like it was Dice, uh, Jose Youngs, who I work with now at MMA Fighting. We had James Lynch, who's like one of the best, like hardworking interviewers in the game. We just had this like really solid squad and we were starting to get some traction. And I started getting like really into it to the point where like I would forego some of my radio stuff just to do like MMA writing. Or like if I had a scoop that I needed to follow up on and try to get the other side of, like I would spend my time trying to get that other side and break some news in the MMA world. And so I was getting really into it. And then I, I actually asked my wife, I'm like, I think I, I think I want to try to make this happen full time. And she was like, we're not in a position to do that. Like, I believe that you could do this, but like, we're just not in a financial position to do this. Like, cause I don't know if your, your, your listeners probably know this, there's not a ton of money in radio unless you're Howard Stern. There's not a <laughs> right. lot of money in it. So I actually was making pretty okay money for a guy on the radio because I was doing a lot of different jobs. So, so that's going on. I'm trying to weigh it out. My wife kind of says, no, nah, we can't do it right now. Uh, so I was just like, all right, I'll just keep grinding away and do what I'm doing. Then Town Square buys us. And we're trying to like fill these different roles. We had different interviews for digital managing editors, which I'm sure you've talked about on the show before. And we had a local election pop up. So we're all stay, we stay late on local election night and we go on the air, we do different things. We're tallying up votes so we can get this information on. And we had just launched the website, live959.com, just launched it. And I was, we all had like credentials and access to it. And I was like, well, why, why don't we just like use this website and like put the results up it'd be silly not to then people can you know click on the website and get this information if they're not listening to am radio at right. 9 30 at night so i made the decision to do it my boss gave me the okay and i did it it did really well and then like 48 hours later uh ariana sheehan who you know Yes. Uh, comes down to the radio station out of the blue. And I have a meeting with her and my marketing president, uh, market president, Peter Barry. And they're like, we're going to like keep seeking out this DME position, but you're here and you stepped up to the plate. Like we want to offer it to you. And they gave me a little bit of a pay bump. And I was like, okay. I was like, so what does this entail? And they told me, you know, you're going to be responsible for all five websites. You're going to try to gain traffic, but you're, you're also in a management position. Like you're the guy, like if anything digital, you're the go-to. And if you have any issues, you come to us and we'll have your back. And I was like, okay. I was like, so now I can take this radio station and bring us into the 21st century and do digital stuff. Like I've been saying we should have been doing this for five years and now I have the okay to do that. And unfortunately it didn't turn out to be that way. It caused more stress in my life. And then on top of that, like once I got this gig, I knew it was going to be a little more, like some more hours attached to my schedule. I'm like, I don't know if I could do this anymore. Like, I don't know if I could do the MMA thing anymore. I don't know if I'm just going to have the time to do it. Like, I have, I got a raise. Like, I feel like I'm moving up in the company. Like, maybe I should just play it safe and just stick to this route. And I had a conversation with James Lynch, who I just mentioned. And I was like, I don't know, man. Like, I don't think I could do this anymore. Like, I think I like... I'm in a good spot right now. I'm traveling a, a pretty safe, solid road right now in this radio thing. I think I just have to like give it a shot and see what happens. 
And he basically told me to F off. Don't do that. Like do so, <laughs> like, even if you do one interview a week, like don't stop, like just do something. Like you don't have to do like full shows. You don't have to get like five interviews every show. Just do like, do one interview a week. Like just stay with it. And I was like, all right, I'll think about it. And there's one UFC fighter who I talked to before he got into the UFC, uh, Mickey Gall. And I had a conversation with him. We did an interview and then we're just chit-chatting off the air and I'm telling him what's going on. And he basically said the same thing. He goes, dude, he goes, don't. He goes, don't. He goes, I have a feeling something big is going to happen for you. Like, just do something in MMA. Like, don't go away. Uh, and then the fan side of thing, like Dice had moved on. Jose Youngs had moved on. James Lynch had moved on. So it's like, I, I thought they were going to actually offer me the editorial position for those guys. And they didn't even offer it to me. They just, somebody kind of went in there and, and took it and no one even got interviewed for it. So I was getting really soured on MMA at that point. And I decided I was going to stop. And then I was like, nah, you know what? I'll do one interview a week. But the problem with me, my friend, is that I can't do things halfway. I can't hmm. just do one interview. Like if I'm going to do this, like I'm going to keep going. And that's what I did. Like I actually like did more once I got back into it. So I was, I mean, my wife and my son barely saw me <laughs> or if I, or if they did see me, I was working. I had my laptop on my lap trying to get work done or write up articles or like edit interviews and stuff like that. So yeah, I had conundrums before. Um, and then even like later on, which we'll probably get to, uh, I had more conundrums, but we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm very happy to share that story because a lot of people, especially if they're young or just recently graduated or look, the workforce is getting far better than it used to be 15 months ago, but there are going to be so many young people in particular who may have gone to school and said, I want to be a sports writer. I want to be a radio host. And they say, well, it's not paying as much as I hoped. I'm just going to do this job to pay the bills and they never get an opportunity to get back in or the work that they put in is not being viewed or consumed by the people who had done it before because they don't know where the consistency is going to be there or why they gave up for two or three or five months. I'm glad you shared that story because it's so easy for so many people, especially early in their careers, to be like, nah, it just didn't work out. I got to take the safe route. But you made sure to say, okay, even though I needed a few pushes from a guy like Mickey Gall and others, I'm going to keep doing this and continue to make this happen, which is amazing. And I want to get to that other country you have in a second, but you did mention covering that fight at the Barclays Center. Describe a big fight feel. It's one of my favorite things to ask people who cover the UFC, any MMA or boxing. I was so thrilled when live sports came back because I knew the big fight feel was going to be the place I wanted to get back to. For those who haven't done it yet or are looking forward to doing it again, describe that feel, what it was like inside the Barclays Center and other events when the MMA fight is just around the corner. So I've covered... A bunch of different events. I've covered Bellator events. I've covered UFC events. The first UFC event I ever covered was actually in all. It was the first event ever in Albany. Derek Lewis versus Shamil Abdurahimov. What the heck? You didn't text me. I probably was sitting next to you during the fight. Didn't even realize it. This is pre-town square, my friend. This is pre-town square. I know that's true. I probably was sitting right behind you. Anyway, that was there as well. Yeah, you were there as well. Yes, <laughs> I was. Um, so that that was a cool experience. There were only like five media people on site, so I got like a lot of access, which I thought was really cool. And then you know I've covered other events like. 208 was just kind of slapped together because the card the month before had already got canceled. And there goes my dog. Don't <laughs> worry, Shiloh. Nobody's here. Uh, so anyways, so they kind of just slapped this thing together and they created a division and they created a championship that made absolutely no sense. They put Holly Holm and Jermaine Durand me in a featherweight title fight while Chris Cyborg was like not fighting for a title, which was bizarre and ridiculous to me. So I don't think I really got the big fight feel from that one. Like Anderson Silva was on the card. So like seeing him make the walk to DMX and fight Derek Brunson and got a win that he shouldn't have gotten. The event was not great. It was not a great event. Uh, Dustin Poirier and Jim Miller had a great fight. But other than that, it was just kind of a kind of an okay event. Um, and I'd covered others since then. Uh, UFC 220 was really cool. That was, that was an event I covered. Uh, Daniel Cormier fought Volkan Ozdemir on that card. Uh, oh. France Agano and Stipe, that was the, their first fight was on that card. So that was the first time I really felt like the big fight feel. Like that first round of Francis and Stipe, I was just like, oh my God, this is crazy. Like Stipe's doing his job and Francis is throwing hams, almost knocking him out and he can't just quite reach him. And then Stipe kind of like, you know, just cruised and, and, and got the win. But the real the time I really felt the big fight feel 
was UFC 244 in November. I went out there to MSG, uh, BMF title fight with Mazadal and Diaz. And I was in, like, I'm always in the back for this stuff because I'm doing all the scrums and all the interviews with the fighters afterwards. But there was no way I was missing that fight. So they gave me a seat up. They gave me a seat on Media Row. Me and James Lynch, we went out there. We watched the fight. And when Mazadal and Diaz made the walk at MSG, I was just like, oh my God, like, I had goosebumps. It was crazy. Like that was like the big fight feel. I'm like, oh my God, like this is so wild. Like when Mazadal came into the Scarface theme and those two are face to face, I was so jacked up, man. Like that's the big fight feel. We were just like, man, like I can't believe I'm here. Like I can't believe I'm sitting here watching this right now. Like I'm just taking this all in. Like I've worked my ass off all week and now I'm just going to sit here. I'm just, I'm just going to enjoy this chaos. And Mazadal went out there and had a great performance and it ended in kind of a weird way, which pissed some people off, but I don't think the fight was going to get much better, but tough to top that one, man. I'm sure hopefully I'll have moments in my career and cover events in my career that will top that. But right now it's kind of tough to beat that one, especially in the world's most famous arena like that. Oh, no doubt. I had the, ha the hairs are standing up for me. Even when you're describing, <laughs> there's something special about the garden for those big fights and the walkout, as you mentioned, with different fighters, the whole lead up to it and the first bell, everything is so exciting for that big fight feel. I love doing that. So you gave us a little bit of a tease. We had conundrum number one in your career. Now a second one, and this is far more recent than the first one of. And I, 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 does, did COVID play a factor in all the second conundrum of what decides to happen next for your career? All right. So my dog is calm now. The family is home. So we're good. So back in... 2000 and 2018, 2000, I, I, the, the dates all kind of like just come together. Uh, my family and I, we decided we were going to try to move to Cape Cod. And we did this whole thing and I got a job out there working for a radio group. And the plan was I was just going to go out there, establish myself. Um, and New Year's Eve, I did a live broadcast for Town Square in 95.9. Um, and that was the last thing I did. Like that was literally the last thing I did. And then like three days later, I was off to the Cape and I, I got a marketing job and I hated it. I just, it just wasn't for me. Like I'm a people person. I like talking to people, but just being around production people, being around on-air talents, like I just missed it too much. Like I'm just, I was like, I'm just not a sale, like a radio salesperson. Like I am a voice. Like I'm, a, I'd rather be producing commercials and doing that kind of stuff than trying to sell people on advertising and on websites and stuff like that it just wasn't for me. So, you know, I'm into it for three months and then I start to realize like, this is just not going to work. Uh, I was like, but I'll stick it out if like the family wants to keep this, this train going. And it turned out just all different things in play. It just wasn't going to. Uh, so after having a conversation with my wife, I made the decision to come back. And at that point I started reaching out to, to different MMA websites and it's being like, do you need somebody? Like, do you need somebody to do video interviews, to do news, to do write-ups? Like whatever you need, like I can do it. Some said, no, some said, no, we're full. Some said, all right, yes, come on. We'll, 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 we'll try to do some things. And at the same time I had been pestering uh, Brian Tucker from MMA fighting, who is kind of like the, the go-to there. He's kind of, he runs like all the combat for, Vo for Vox media. And Jose Young, so I worked with the fan side just as because Ariel was gone, Mark Ramundi was gone, Sean Alshadi was gone, and like the the MMA fighting was going through like a crazy loop of just like people thought it was like the downfall of the website because all these big names were leaving. Luke Thomas was gone too. And Jose kept hitting me up, like, hey, shoot an email to this person, say like, what do you need me to do? And he just kept telling me, like, kept pestering me, like, reach out to these people, reach out to these people. So I, I shot Brian Tucker probably 19 emails over like a three-month span. I just kept hitting him up. Like anytime I did anything, like if I did an interview with the fighter, if I broke news, like I was like, here's the link to me breaking this fight. Here's right. this interview I did with this fighter. You guys wrote this up, a morning report based on this interview. And then finally, like after like the 18th or 19th email, he finally responded to me and was like, all right, I'll talk to you. Like we'll, do, we'll plan a call. So I took my lunch break working for the Cape Cod radio station and just drove around Cape Cod and did this phone interview with Brian Tucker. And he was like, all right, you know, you know, I like your ideas. I like what you're trying to do. And, uh, you know, we'll get back to you. So I'm like, okay. So I tell my wife like, Hey, I just had this big interview. I was like, give me a year. I was like, I don't know if it's going to happen overnight. It probably won't. Um, 
because I know they have other spots to fill. I was like, let me just do this freelance thing and just see what I can do with it. Give me one year. I was like, and if one year, like nothing comes from it, I will stop forever. I will never interview another fighter. I will never write another article. I will just go all in on whatever you want me to do. Like I will get a, I'll sell cars. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I was like, just give me one year and let's see if I can make this work. And she was very supportive of that. Um, and then I just was off to the races. I was, I, I was probably on with like seven or eight different websites by the time MMA fighting finally came calling in January of 2020 and had a second interview with them. And they're like, yeah, we have other interviews. So we'll let you know in like two weeks. So two weeks go by and I don't hear anything. And at the same time, uh, a company had reached out to me like that was offering to pay me like really good money to like interview some of the sponsored fighters that they had. He goes, we'll pay you like, give me it. And I threw out a number, just throw out a wild number to see if he'd say yes. And he did, he did. So I was like, all right, if I can like get this and like do these interviews, like I'm set, like I'm back to making the money I was making when I was at the radio station. I'm like, I'm in, I was like, all right, this was a good decision. Like either way, if I don't get this job, like I'm okay for a while. And then so I reach out, <laughs> I reach out to the, ma the manager and I said, Hey, I just like, I'm not trying to be a pest. I was like, you got to let me know because like, I have this offer that just came in and you know, it's really good money. I have to let them know like by the end of the week. And he responds with, you didn't get the offer. And I was like, what are you talking about? And then he called me on the phone and was like, oh, I guess I just broke some news. Uh, there's going to be an offer forthcoming. Uh, welcome to the team. And I was like, Oh my God, this is crazy. Go. Yeah. Yeah, I was so pumped. And I call my wife and I tell her, I'm like, apparently there's an offer coming. I was like, but I'll call you like when I get it. And then I got it and I signed it. And then they sent over like, you know, the contract details. And I told her about it. And she was like, oh my God, you got to be kidding me. And then, uh, so I get that. And then of course, literally like the day I'm about to start, the pandemic is going on. The, the world had just literally gotten shut down. The United States, Massachusetts all got shut down on the first day that I started with MMA fighting. So the oh. first the first few months were a little harrowing, to say the least. But you got through it. And yeah, that's where I got we are now. It. That's where we are now, right? Survived furloughs, good. survived okay. cuts, survived all that. I'm like, oh, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the rook. I'm definitely the first one gone, no doubt about it. And somehow I, I survived through and we made it to the other side, my man. Yes, and that other side is this weekend UFC's big fight. Conor McGregor's back inside the octagon. I'm sure some people who listen to this podcast are like, finally, these guys preview the fight. That's what I wanted to hear the whole we got to talk about the career stuff. we got to offer the advice for the young listeners and everything else. All right, so help us break it down. What are you looking at at this weekend's card? Is Conor McGregor, I feel like every time I interview, by the way, I'm led with, is this McGregor's last fight? For like the fifth time I've asked you, is this <laughs> McGregor's last fight? <sighs> See, that's, that's such a deep question every time you ask me because you can make an argument for both, right? Like if he goes out there and loses to Dustin, it definitely he his stock definitely takes a hit. Some of that allure kind of loses its luster a little bit. But at the same time, he's still Conor McGregor. He's still the red panty night guy. There's still options for him. You could throw him in there with with Mazadal. You could throw him in there with, and do the trilogy fight with Nate Diaz. So it's not like it's not like he's gone. Like if he loses this fight, it's not like his career ends. I will say. No matter what happens, I will say no to that answer. But I'm if you're asking me if this could be his last UFC fight, I wouldn't rule it out. But I could definitely see him getting back in the boxing ring at some point. Um, I think in terms of his future in the sport, if he wants to get back to that guy who became a two-division champion, if he wants to go back to that, that guy who's just on that incredible run for a while, if he wants to be a world champion again, he's got to win this fight. This is a must. This is the pivotal must win for him. He needs this one. While he does have other options, if he wants to get back to that to that podium, so to speak, he's got to win this fight. But he's got a tall task ahead of him. I don't know if six months of preparing to defend leg kicks and preparing to defend takedowns and everything that Dustin Poirier brings to the table, all the the changes he's made in his life since that first fight at UFC 178 all these years ago. I just don't know if he can beat this guy. I think I think Poirier just has all the momentum. I think he's got so much confidence that he could take everything Connor can throw and just walk right through it. I just don't know if he wins this fight. I could be wrong. And every time I feel like I say that about Connor, he goes out there and shocks us. But I feel like this is Poirier's time, man. I feel like he deserves to get this rub. I thought he got the rub a little bit from the win in January. But if he goes out there and stops Connor again, I mean, he he's on the path of superstardom. There's no doubt about it. So. I think Poirier is going to win, but 
I mean, McGregor is such a wild card, man. You don't know. He's so mysterious. You don't know what he's been doing the last six months. He's a freak of nature and motivated. Connor is, is a dangerous man. So I just don't know if he can make all those adjustments in six months. I feel like I was one of the many who doubted Dustin Poirier in that fight most recently against McGregor that it's just Connor. He's going to win. And the performance he put on, I think it put a lot of people like, okay, this guy, as you just mentioned, could be the next star, the mega star, everything else. And this fight again with these guys coming up this weekend is going to be hopefully a show for fans again. You know, you did say boxing, though, about McGregor. You don't think he's going to fight like YouTube stars, right? Is he going to get like another Mayweather fight, De La Hoya? You don't think he's fighting one of the Paul brothers or something, right? I, I, oh no. I wouldn't rule out him fighting Jake Paul at some point. Oh my God. No, Mike. No. This is where you know where this road is leading to, right? Yes. Like it's leading to this point. Yeah. I mean, I really hope Tired Woodley just ends this misery once and for all. But the, like, I know that's kind of a, a weird term in media, like the click side of us. I hope Jake Paul never loses a fight because this, the traffic this guy generates in the combat sports world is unbelievable. Like, I still can't believe it. The amount of people who actually like just care about this guy, whether they hate him or love him, it's, I mean, this guy generates so much interest. Jake Paul, three professional boxing fights. He gets more interest than, than anybody. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. And if Jake beats Tyron Woodley, whew, <laughs> I feel like, I feel like at some point we're going to see the Connor fight and it drives me bananas. And I hate that I'm saying this into a live microphone, but I think the chances grow every time Jake wins and keeps beating MMA fighters. I feel like the road to Connor continues on. I think we'll get there someday if he keeps winning. What a world we're living in where we're talking about the most popular fighter in the world fighting somebody on YouTube, but credit to credit to the, both of the Pauls. If they're making this work and having it happen, they found a way to make money for themselves and they're loading up their pockets with money and everything else. Is there another fight on this weekend's card? I know McGregor and Dust are going to see the headlines. Whether it's on the undercard, whether it's somewhere on the card where you say, you got to watch this fight because it could be a show stealer. Dude, the co-main event's phenomenal. Steven Wonderboy Thompson against Gilbert Burns. Gilbert Burns, of course, first fight back since getting knocked up by Kamaru Usman in February. And Steven Thompson, at the young age of 38, has got the salt and pepper hair going on, <laughs> just driving kids from school to the karate gym to, to do karate stuff. One of the, I mean, just literally the nicest guy you will ever have the opportunity to speak with. Huge fight for Wonderboy. He's been trying to get back to this title. He's had road bumps. Of course, he had the two shots at Woodley, but he's close, man. And the fans are behind him to get that title shot because Usman hasn't fought him yet. Usman's fought and beat a lot of these guys, but he's never fought Wonderboy. And if he goes out there and beats Gilbert Burns, I have a, I don't know if he jumps Colby Covington, but he's definitely like his next fight should be for the belt. I think he jumps over Leon Edwards because of how that fight with Nate, Nate Diaz ended at the last pay-per-view. So not much on the line for Gilbert Burns. He's going in this pressure-free, man. Unless, like, he's just like, yeah, if I lose, so what? If I win, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just defending my spot. And then he becomes a massive Colby Covington fan, which no fighter has ever said. But if but if he beats Wonderboy and Colby goes out there and beats Usman, Gilbert can slide back into a title shot. But I feel like Wonderboy has everything to lose in this fight and and everything to gain and Gilbert's got nothing to lose. He's got no pressure on him. So interesting fight. I love the matchup. You get the striker versus the grappler. And I love how both guys are bringing in experts in their fields. Steven's got Ryan Hall, who's also fighting on this card. And then Gilbert Burns brought in Raymond Daniels to, to prepare for Wonderboy Thompson, who's one of the greatest kickboxers of all time. So really interesting fight. I'm bummed we lost Sean Brady versus Kevin Lee, but still all in all, great card. I'm very excited for it. Saturday, July 10th, 2021, UFC back with arguably more than likely it's going to be the best card of the entire summer. Plug the social media handles in the website one more time for people who just heard a little bit of the, a small sample size of the preview. Where can they find all your stuff, whether it's during the fight, pre-fight, post-fight, where they can follow all your stuff? Thank you, my friend. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. That's where I do most of my social media stuff at MikeHeck underscore JR. I'm trying with with Instagram. I keep making resolutions that I'll get better, but I just get worse. Uh, you can follow me there, M underscore Heck JR. Uh, you can find all my work at MMAfighting.com. Host a bunch of shows for them. Uh, we do an interview show on Tuesdays called What the Heck. It dropped today. Uh, 
had talks with Tanner Bozer, Justin Janes, who bet his entire fight purse on himself this past Saturday and lost and still had the, uh, the, and still did an interview with me, which I found pretty amazing. Uh, Julia Avila, who also got a big win on Saturday. Angela Lee, the one Adam White champion, is getting ready to make her return. And I also spoke with Ariel Hawani, who is coming back to MMA fighting. The MMA hour is back on August 16th, so we're very excited about that. Uh, I host a show called Between the Links. It's a debate show where pit journalist versus journalist. Basically, we're stealing around the horn and making it an <laughs> MMA show. Uh, so it's like PTI and around the horn had a baby and out came between the links. Uh, and then we have the preview and post fight shows uh, live on our YouTube page. So make sure you just subscribe to all that. And guys, you are the man. Let me just say, I, I really love what you're doing here, man. Like I, I, I listened to your first podcast about in the second one, you made me wait a week or a few days to, to find <laughs> out the real story about what happened with town square. And uh, you know, just seeing what you're doing now and, and offering advice to some of the up and comers and, you know, especially trying to get into radio and get into the media industry. Like, Kudos to you, man. I, t I take my hat off to you. I think you're doing a, a really great thing, and uh, I'm glad we were able to make this happen. Thank you so much. I appreciate the kind words. You can't leave yet, though. You can't leave for the dog or the kids yet, because i got to close, I guess I do, for everyone. Best advice, if someone's listening to this, you get the opportunity now, Mike Heck. Although you give me the nice compliments that I'm helping out the youth, here's your opportunity to help out the youth. Whether that's age or starting off the career, the best advice Maybe someone's playing Ed Sheeran right now in a local radio station and wants <laughs> off and wants to do what you're doing. The best advice to do MMA writing and interviewing and videos and covering the big fights. How do people get to where Mike Hack is right now? Well, the best advice I can give you is something that I sprinkled in earlier. Like if you want to do interviews and, and do all that stuff, like just interview everybody, especially in MMA. Like get to know the regional prospects, get to know the next, the next generation of fighters because those are the guys and gals who by the time you get your break – they're going to want to talk to you. Um, and this MMA thing, like for those who were just like, oh, I can't believe this Mike Heck guy got a job in three months. No, it took me a long time to get to where I am. It took me five or six years of busting my ass, of working multiple jobs, of finding ways to get to events and paying out of my own pocket and doing all of these things. This is, this is something you're going to have to embrace. This is a grind more than any other sport that you can cover. Basketball, football, baseball, None of it compares to the grind that MMA has because it's still an infant sport and it got some notoriety. It's on ESPN and that's a really great thing, but just bust your ass and just know that it ain't going to happen overnight. Like if you really want to do this, you need to be prepared to spend years and years honing your craft and waiting for that opportunity and just try to find a way to learn how to do everything, whether it's video interviews, editing, whether it's podcast audio, whether it's breaking news, whether it's just writing features, like find a way to learn how to do a little bit of everything and then just embrace the grind, man. Cause when you finally get there, you look back on those days and be like, man, you appreciate a lot more because this is not an easy road to get to where I am and uh, find yourself a good lady who supports your dreams. Cause I have <laughs> found that. And uh, because of her, I wouldn't be where I am today. So that's it. I echo that advice as well. Having that supportive wife and that family back that says, all right, we're going to let you do your thing as long as you continue to bust your ass for us. They're going to have your back. Very good advice from you. Now, whether somewhere in the Northeast, Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, I don't know where, but hopefully very soon, you and I will be sitting next to each other for a UFC, Bellator, whatever it is, fight. Look, our last names, if they go alphabetical order, the G and the H, we might just by chance be sitting next to each other. So it could happen. We've been talking for years. The fact that I've got to watch your career grow. Now you're seeing what I'm doing. I'm so happy we've got this relationship with each other. Best of luck for the future. I know you're going to crush it. And I know we're going to be talking again soon. And hopefully with some blood flying and some big fights <laughs> on the way. Sounds good, man. Thank you for having me.